Joe. Um, yeah, he uh, is the editorial page editor of Turkish Daily News, which is one of two, one uh, English speaking Turkish newspaper. Um, and he has also written uh, for the Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, various uh, network things. I also an author of a uh, book on the Kurdish question. Uh, Mustafa, please. From the morning or good afternoon, and all of that. And first of all, many thanks to Hans and Yuchin for organizing this event and having you here. It's really very interesting to be in very interesting talks. Um, well, my topic is the Ottoman Empire and Turkey and the question, and I think we should I should first a little bit touch upon what the Ottoman Empire was. I'm sure you're all familiar with it, you know about it, but let me see how, how I see the Ottoman Empire and how I see the transition from the Ottoman Empire to the Turkish Republic, which I see as a very crucial phenomenon in which Explains many things we have in Turkey today, many problems we have in Turkey today, including the Kurdish issue. Well, the Ottoman Empire was a very long lived empire, and it lasted for more than six, a bit more than six centuries, and uh, from the uh, 13th century, later in the century, to uh, 19, basically 1922, or you say, yeah, for you, Nineteen twenty-two would be the end of the, the, the Ottoman Sultans, you know, so it's last for a long time. And uh, this war and it's ruled much of what we call the Balkans, the Middle East, North Africa today, including this piece of land called the Tolu that we are now in. Uh, and one of the remarkable things about the Ottoman Empire, I mean there are things that really fight the harbor. I think one of the remarkable virtues of the Empire was that it was pluralists. It was a multi ethnic and multi ethnic Empire. Well, many empires like that already, but not all. And especially in the Middle Ages in Europe, states that used to impose their beliefs, their identity on people, like we saw in the Catholic Spain. Spain, I think, the Catholic King of Spain tried to convert all cities. Thoughts. Whereas in the Ottoman Empire, it was accepted that Jews and Christians uh, and different faiths or different ethnicities, for that matter, were there and they had their space and they were accepted. And this actually comes from the basic teaching of Islam, which uh, respects Judaism and Christianity, although it's there seems somewhat uh, like not as good as Islam, but still there said, well, there is some truth in those traditions, so they are accepted to, to exist. And the Ottomans accepted Jews and Christian, different Christian denominations, the Indian, the Ottomans, and the Ottomans, the Greek, the Greeks, the Armenian, the churches. They accepted their existence and they lived under the Ottoman Empire. And actually, interestingly, when the Jews were expelled from Spain, they came not too surprised into the Ottoman Empire, which they had more than the Jews in the space. Of course, they were not equal citizens until the 19th century. And the traditional Islamic law regarded Jews and Christians as Zimbis, which means they're protected, but somewhat technical. But they were even given equal citizenship in the 19th century Ottoman reforms, which brought in many ideas from the West, like constitutionalism, like legalism, and the idea of equal citizenship. Uh, and when the Ottoman the Ottoman Empire, I think that that's an important thing we should know. The Ottoman Empire was, in some ways, a pre modern empire from one perspective. But the other thing is, the empire started to modernize itself uh, from the 18th century on. And especially in the 19th century, there were many legal reforms. And one of the to work out was the idea of the debate about the social free markets, uh, as we had the next speaker for much more than to explain it to us in a better way. Uh, there, were, there were debates between French Enlightenment and the British way of modernization, for example. And some of them were more inspired by the British liberal tradition, others were more influenced by the French Revolution and the Jacobin tradition of an enlightenment imposed on the society, for example. So there were all different sorts of debates. In the Ottoman Empire, we had a liberal party, the Ottoman party, which is freedoms in Turkish, was uh, right there, and uh, you can quote it. 
the individual defending squads. So the modernization of the empire started, and that's why the Ottoman Empire became a constitutional monarchy in 1870. This is important because the official Turkish history of the Republic depicts the Ottoman Empire as a dark age, and then the Republic came across and shone like a star or a sun and just enlightened all of us before it was darkness, which is not true. And that's the, of course, the Republic brought in many reforms and continued modernization, but there's a history of that. So it's not, did not come, did not come to be ex nihilo. Now, of course, this multi ethnic and multi religious of the structure of the Ottoman Empire started to crumble down, started to disintegrate in the 19th century, basically because of nationalism. And first, the Balkan minorities, the Muslim minorities, the Balkans, they started the national revolts against the empire, the Serbian and the East, and they gained their national states. So the empire started to retreat and the best. And, and actually, nationalism explains both the fall of the Ottoman Empire and the rise of modern Turkish nation states. Uh, and the great tragedy that they fell on our in 1915, which is very much debated right now, which we can all around, is a product of not the Ottoman system, but a product of the fall of the Ottoman system. Because our names existed under the Ottoman rule for six centuries over half the Ottoman Actually, the Ottomans define our names as the loyal nation. But when our name nationalism came in with the Russian support, you had a reaction to nationalism. And in the war years uh, uh, during World War One, uh, from in, especially in the faithful year of 1915, you had an Armenian nationalist coming in and backlash against the white central government, which led to the deportation of white people, and which led to horrible tragedy, uh, for sure. But it was because of the fall of the system. Uh, and what happened was that during the last decades of the Ottoman Empire, there were different ideological trends. One was called Ottomanism. And the Ottomanist trend were saying, well, we are all equal citizens. Let's just emphasize the equal citizenship for all citizens. Let's try to keep it the Ottomanist model. The other idea was Islamism, which was much more refined and sophisticated than today's Islamic fundamentals for radicalists. And it was a way of saying, well, the Christian nations will. Go and there's no way to keep them down, keep them in the empire. But let's emphasize the stars and unify and bond with different, different Islamic ethnicities of the empire. And there was Turkism as a third element. And the Turkists said that, well, Turks are really the core of the empire. And others will go, and Arabs will go, and Albanians will go. So just let's really emphasize the Turkish element. And you had debates and you know, rivalry. And between these two groups. Well, Ottomans and I a little bit earlier because it was obvious that you could beat the uh, Greeks or the Serbians or the Bulgarians, and especially after the Balkan Wars, uh, in which you know, many Balkan nations fought against the Ottoman Empire. Ottomans were defaulting, but then you had these, these two debates in Islamist and Turkists. Uh, and of course, there were different shades in the way between these groups. And what happened was when the Turkish Republic was founded after a war of liberation against the occupying powers, because Turkey was occupying Turkey, first of all, entered the World War I on the one side of Germany, and the Axis powers was the war, and after the war, Turkey was occupied by Greece, partly by British, and it was under like British occupation. So the, 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 the Turks, and actually all the groups in Anatolia, fought a war of liberation against. Uh, new powers. And then Turkey was a standard new world population, meaning the first. And the Turkey people have been the world first. And the war was the world war one, and the Turkish Republic was proclaimed in 1923. And I think there's a fateful point here. Uh, the Turkish war of liberation was not led by a revolutionary committee or something, it was led by a part of it, the Turkish. Parliament of Turkey, not Turkish, but part of the Parliament of Turkey, which included Turks, Kurds, uh, some Arabs, which were still in the Ottoman uh, and all sorts of different people, like some imams, some very secular people. It was a pluralist uh, parliament 
which really represented the whole nation. And in the parliament, you have two different over time. You, you, there you have two different trends. One was called the first group, the other one was called the second. And the first group was very much tied to the persona of Mustafa Kemal Ataturk, the founder, the, the first president. Uh, the second group was ironically a bit more different. They were still fighting for independence, yeah, but they had a bit more for you. And soon, the first group turned into the People's Republican Party, the CHP, the Turkish officials. And its leader was Mustafa Kemal Ataturk. But he was not called at the time, he was called Mustafa Kemal Pasha, General Mustafa uh, and the second group was not really on the same page, and it was over time it turned into be led by Khalid Karebi, which was another general, but it was a difficult And in 1943, the JNF uh, was there, and, and in 1944, the second group turned into another party called Taraki Padraki Padraki, or the Progressive Party. So what you basically have is two different parties that emerged after the World Depression. And the CHP was very much influenced by what I would call enlightenment fundamentalism. It is, it's the same idea of French revolutionaries that you need to learn to modernize, you need to create a homogeneous nation. All ethnic differences should be swept aside. You should homogenize the language. You should get rid of religion and tradition, which is you can, because religion is by definition a backward. Mm -hmm. uh, and freedom is good, but unless you achieve this modernity, freedom is bad. So you have to postpone freedom to a point in which you will convert everybody to what you want. So, and if you can turn people into new human beings, freedom is good. But I, I, I thought that until that point, you cannot really accept it or the market or the market order. That was the CHP idea, uh, which came from well, you know, general tradition office. Uh, and then, then, then there was the other party, the second party, the Iraqi, the, the, the more recent party. Well, they were not uh, inspired by the vision. They were, first of all, not that much in focus on the state as a you know, uh, Asian modernity. They were believing in free markets. They, they, they wrote their program and reports. There is emphasis on free markets. They were more influenced by the British tradition of modernization, in which tradition and religion is not seen as an end, but it just continues along the way as you modernize and you harmonize these uh, the tradition and uh, modernity. And they were interestingly, uh, uh, and they were interestingly interested in integrating the Kurds into Turkey. Charles of the leader of the party, wrote a Kurdish report in 1924. Well, it was a report of Kurds. Uh, and how long the Kurds are, but it's just a bit He said, well, we should integrate the Kurds through agriculture, through you know, this fostering trade in that region, and through you know, spreading education, and through, through emphasizing the common traditional values of this part of the Kurds. Where does the CHP? The, the, the Jacobin party, the Kamas party, was thinking about Turkey bombing the Kurds, and they did. Uh, in, well, and what happened was that there was indeed a Kurdish revolt in 1945, the Kurdish revolt, and the CHP, first of all, Russian revolt, and then closed down the second progressive party, the Bolshevik party, and established a single party regime, as we call it in Turkey. The single party in the region is actually a euphemism for truly speaking dictatorship. Uh, so, and not just the second party, but all civil society was crushed. I mean, Sufi so order would have gone down, and even the Freemasons would have gone down. Feminist order would have gone down. Everything outside of state structure would have been gone down because they believe in the principle of that states should really guide the whole society and state knows everything. Essentially, manage the whole society. And in the, in the 30s, this trend, this authoritarian tradition became even much more uh, solidified because 
in the, I mean, the 30s was a time where in which you had a period of fraternal Europe. Not really was writing, the Soviet Union was there. Well, Soviet Union wasn't doing really that, seemingly, but it's fighting plans and so on. And the Turkish is TV companies. We didn't study this when we were doing the Turkish. We had the Israel system, so the Turkey was the great number. Everyone lost the Turkey. The Turkey was actually the seed race of the army, army and nation. And the size of the Turkish skull was fading and dust. So it's an obvious racist idea right there. Well, these. Well, what happened was that I mean, uh, these ideas didn't prevail that much, but their traces are still there, and it's why still you have a very wide range of national image. And the state thinks national is a great thing, national is all divided and homogeneous and strong. And I think that that state of that state of fraternity, that tradition still continues in Turkey, and it's continued all the way. But what happened was uh, I just said the second line was crushed. The more conservative slash liberal line was crushed uh, in 1945, but it didn't die out, of course. And Turkey had its first fair and free elections. Well, we had elections on the other side, but the Republicans had. The first of free elections was held in 1950. And what happened in 1950? The party which represented that conservative slash liberal line came to power. With the motto, enough, the nation has the word. Uh, because that is interesting, because the nation has the word is interesting phenomenon. Because in the, in the 30s, the CHT elites defined themselves as a government for the people, in spite of the people. <laughs> and that's different from the American government speaking like government of the people, my people, in spite of the people. So the, 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 the opposition. Uh, which was crushed, came back with, under, the, under the name Democratic Party, and they came with a great vote. The people were fed up with this fraternity tradition. And they, and they won three elections in a row. All of the 1950s or 60s was under this Democratic Party. Under the Turkey tribe, we got the first foreign investment, there was a Marshall Plan, American money came in, Turkey just both became a member of NATO. The economy really made a great progress. And uh, what happened? Well, in 1960, the military stage of military coup, uh, because the Republic was going the wrong way, it was diverging from the original line. They executed the Prime Minister and two of the ministers after a short trial, and they again restored order. And then we had military coups and indirect coups, and, uh, and still goes on in Turkey. And this dichotomy between this authoritarian state tradition. And of course, we're part of a society which lacks that. Because when you have a fraternity regime, some people like it because it's, I mean, they benefit from that. But the, but the bigger part of society doesn't like that. So you have this dichotomy between this fraternity state tradition and the corporate party which presents that to speak. And on the other hand, you have this conservative slash liberal slash curve slash highs and lows and all this big chunk of people who just want. A more open system, a more open regime. Interestingly, liberals have been very influential in power because they create the firepower intellectually. They just create the ideas in which conservatives are getting more and more interested. And I think, thanks to this tradition, right now, we are having a very interesting synthesis of Islam and liberalism, which I think is a promise again for the whole of the world. If that's not an issue which I do not want. And I think that's a good idea. I think that's a good idea. It's a very important thing. I think it's a very important thing. I think it's a very important thing. Uh, okay. A lot of thoughts from me. Speech about these. And maybe I should follow on the curve a little bit. And, uh, well, I think this background can give us some ideas, but if we speak specifically on the Kurds, I think the Kurdish issue is important because in the case study of this authoritarian tradition, it's a case study which shows that how this authoritarian tradition will be harmed through these efforts from our nation for creating a real one. Uh, the other one, there, 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 the only thing that the fundus is that they have no physical world and so forth, but that's based on the fact that they're not going to be able to get back to the fact that they're not going to be able to get back to the fact that they're not going to be able to get back to the fact that they're not going to be able to get back to the fact that they're not going to be able to get back to the fact that they're not going to be able to get back to the
that any of those things the current population which exists in the world is they are closer to Persian than they are to the church. So they're not ethnic enough first. The fact that they are they're not the first has been fine for them. Uh, anyway, to think of something about that really counts and under the last day of my mind, I remember Joel Bob's despite the distance curves on there was actually being quite a problem. But when it comes out that they raise a set the other ones you feel they thought that's kind of the interest in the identity of the site that is a cycle of their vision and then the design. She's not the same as the best thing. Different entities went to the same way of the But for their excellent ideas, maybe you should mention how we look at that. She told me that we should want out of the entities. We should be saying, so you're not feeling the sense of the national world. So, in the mind of that, what they see is based upon what we have to do. And they started, and I find it quite a good report after the report, establishing this for a certain generation. A first time to the best. And the legal secret must. And from in terms of the art of the place for women, not only in there, they have some things on the people in the back and say, so much. People on the center, but this is the very end of So many institutions like that. So, so that is a situation that needs to be a step back. And Kurt first told them that they were going to have the term mountain, Kurt, not mountain, which was off So they find that those living in the front of the public, the same thing, and she comes to them. It's a theory for me of the Bruce Kurt in Malaysia, and who's going to say, so much. So they turn to the top, to the right of the Kurt. And like the way you would have this, it was a theory for the Kurt.